because they don't have the ability or the power to do what John was talking about, to justify our sin and to save us. But they do bring us into a place where Christ is. And then he justifies us. He saves us. He washes away our sins, white as snow, white as wool. That was a really cool endeavor because it was honest and raw. Um, the second big thing that kind of uh, we were really focusing in on last week, how many of you guys remember just how much I love chocolate? You guys remember that? Wow. That's, I hope that that's the only thing you walked away with. Um, <laughs> I'm kidding. Chocolate, fantastic. Okay. I was thinking about it on the way to church. But anyway, the idea behind it was that if you love chocolate, then you love chocolate in every form. And the idea behind it was that if you love Jesus, then you don't just love this style of worship or that church teaching or this guy the way that he preaches. If it's about Christ, you want in because it's Jesus that you love. So, oh, we're singing a hymnal and it's about Jesus, I'm in. Oh, we're, we're singing, cool, I'm in. As long as it gives glory to God and it brings me closer to him, he's what I want. He's what I'm interested in. And that was the other kind of big thing that, that we were really talking about last week. Just about how if you're passionate and if you're in love with Christ, then you want to know him in every possible way that you could know him. In a way that is healthy and, and builds you up. So with that being said, let's look at one of those ways now. Discipline of meditation. That's what we're going to be talking about today. The discipline of meditating on scripture. And I'll give you a lot of verses on it and so on. Uh, when we get into that section. Now, almost every part of our world is really interesting. Almost every part of your day and my day is very different than, pe than people's days in other places. Let me give you some examples. I have some friends that lived in Portland and they moved here. They owned a business in Portland. Um, they owned a Baba business in Portland. They're related to you, which is funny. But anyways, and uh, to you, Joe, yeah. So we were, <laughs> I, was, I was having a conversation with them and I said, so what's it like moving to California? And they opened up a Baba business here too. And they said, you know, the interesting thing is, is in Portland, it was a lot easier to open up the business, a lot less difficult, a lot less hoops that you had to jump through. And, you know, it was kind of like slow paced. Here, everything is super fast paced. Um, the, the wife said that, you know, when we opened up the business, instantly within a week, we received all this like information from like, oh, you need live and care people. Oh, do you need to buy like, you know, Baba furniture? I don't know. Um, <laughs> Like, uh, you know, like handicap access ramps and stuff like that, fire extinguishers. But they received all of these promotions about buying things for their business. And they said, man, everything's just so much faster paced in California. I was talking to friends that had lived in Spain, uh, different friends that lived in Austria, lived in Germany. Um, another friend of mine that lived in, obviously, in Romania. Uh, and when, whenever they come visiting, different people that I meet into California, and um, they come and they visit for a number of months, I say, hey, what's the biggest difference that you noticed? And they said, man, everybody's in a rush. Everybody's always, you know, when's the due date for that? Yesterday, you know, like just get it done, you know, and we just hustle, all right? It's, it's an American thing and it's even worse in California, all right? Like everything just has to happen right away. And we live in a very rushed society. And the interesting thing is that it permeates every single part of our lives. It just, it's, it's everywhere. And let me give you some examples. Everything that we do is scheduled with the beginning and an end. Okay, some things are pretty basic and pretty normal all over the world, like work. You got to work 40 hours a week. You got to, you know, accomplish these tasks. But if you own your own company, then you think you're like, oh, you know, I work. I own my own company. I can work whatever hours I want. Yeah, right. You got to work like 80 hour weeks. Or if you're in management, you got to work like 80 hour weeks. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, but it's always scheduled. Everything has a beginning and an end. This is a task. You have to accomplish that. In school, it's the same thing. Every night you got to read two chapters in this book and you got to do homework for that thing and you have to attend class at 9 a.m. on Monday and then on Tuesdays and Thursdays you have it at 1 p.m. But everything is scheduled at the beginning and an end. In church, a lot of times we end up being in the same way. Now, don't get me wrong. These things aren't bad things. They're just bad when they're in and over excess, when this kind of takes over all of our lives. In church, it's no different. Some of you are here five days a week. Some of you are here six days a week. And Sundays we have service, Sunday morning, Sunday evening, and you have order the in the morning, and then you have 30 minutes of, of uh, the first message, and then you have about 45 minutes of different specials, and you got a 45-minute sermon, and bam, there's Sunday morning. Some of you didn't know that's how it works. That's how it works every Sunday morning. Almost. Uh, and then Monday we have worship practice, and then Tuesday we have discipleship and prayer, and then Wednesday we have uh, youth choir and orchestra. Actually, that's on Friday now, and then Thursdays we have big choir. Fridays you have youth night, and then Saturdays we're always doing special events. It's so organized. And it's not a bad thing to be organized, but it gets bad when that kind of just takes over your entire life. 
And let me, let me explain to you where, where it really starts to become a problem. Our relationships with Christ become the same way. They become tasks on a to-do list. I got to wake up and spend 15 minutes with Jesus. That means that I spend from 7 to 7.15 with Christ. I got to read my devotional because Eddie's going to ask me on Tuesday. So it's Tuesday at 4 o'clock and I got to read my devotional because it's Tuesday. And at 7 o'clock, he's going to go, did you read? Did you write? Okay, you next. did you read and write? And then did you? Because discipleship's coming up. And because this is supposed to be supplemental and not replace my time with Jesus, but supplement it, I got to also spend some other time reading and doing some sort of devotionals. So we schedule time with Christ on our schedule, not on his, on our needs, not on his leading. And the dangerous part of that is this, is that we miss out on something huge, on something gigantic. Yeah, I wrote down our, our schedules, our relationships with Jesus consist on a scheduled appointments and homework reading. When it should be a relationship that does this big thing. This is like my new favorite word, and by new I mean like for a long time I've loved this word, but God's been bringing it up a lot in my heart. We miss what it means to just pioneer with Christ. That's, that's a good word, isn't it? That's a fan. I remember we were talking once, and you were experiencing that, and I was so excited. Oh, okay, here's why pioneering with Christ is important. Here's why pioneering in your relationship with him is important. It looks very different, very, very different than scheduling 15 minutes with Christ and then spending those, and you're watching your watch the entire time, and 14, okay, let me uh, pray also for the missionaries, and then 15, done, and then you're already gone out the door. You know what I'm talking about? Here's the exciting thing. Look, it's, and I mean pioneering in, in the most basic of ways. I mean like this. Like, um, you guys have all heard of Lewis and Clark. They hopped on the Mississippi, and then they, like, rode that all the way to, like, the wherever. Okay, they went forever to the mountains. Yeah. <laughs> Do you realize that there was no way that Lewis and Clark could have scheduled how long their trip was going to take? There's no possible way. All they knew was this. We're going on a journey, and it's going to be full of adventure, and we're in. Who knows how long this is going to take? Might take a year, might take six months, might take 30. I don't know. We may not come back. But all they knew was that they were going on an adventure. What if the way that we approached our relationship with Christ was full of pioneering? Where we go, you know what, Lord? Um, I always pray the same prayer before I eat food. You probably have yours memorized. I've got mine memorized. Do you want to hear my prayer before I eat food? All right, this is this is true story. This is the prayer that automatically comes to my head whenever I'm praying to eat. I ate today, and I prayed it, and I was like, ah, oh, I'm doing it again, you know? Where I go, um, oh, man, now I forgot it. You know what? I don't remember it. Anyways, it's, <laughs> I need some food in front of me, and it'll just trigger, man. Yeah. Yeah, or, okay, how about this? The way that I always enter into prayer is always the same way. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus. That's like, you know, some people, the way that they enter into prayer, like, like okay, guys, okay, let, let's pray. Father, Lord God. Like, that's just their thing, you know, Father, Lord God. Uh, I know another guy, true story, young guy, and every time he prays, he prays the same way. Tato nostro dumnezeule lui. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's the way he opens prayer every time. It's so funny. You probably know what I'm talking about. Stop that. <laughs> you weren't supposed to figure that out. All right? But it's funny because we all do that. So back to pioneering. What if we were to pioneer in our relationships with Christ a little more like this? And we said, you know what, Lord? Look, every time I pray, I pray this way. Every time I come before you, it's at 7 in the morning and until 7.15. You know what, God? Tomorrow, I'm just going to, you know, I'm just, I'm going to wake up not at 7. I'm going to wake up at 6.30. And God, there's 45 minutes in there. Um, and if you want me to wake up earlier, I'll wake up earlier. Or, you know what, God, I came home from work, and I usually spend a little bit of time in prayer now, and then, you know, I hang out and this and that. You know what, God, I'm just going to start prayer, and I'm just going to let you lead, and I'm just going to pioneer with you. And wherever you want to go, and whatever you want to talk about, and wherever you want me to be, I'm not going to leave until in my heart I don't feel convicted anymore, until I feel content with the way that it is that I have a conversation and a relationship with you. What if the way that we approached God wasn't by putting him into a schedule, but we just started to just kind of sit there in silence and say, you know what, Lord, wherever you want to lead, I'm here. God, I always pray on my knees at the foot of my bed. 
And you know what? It, it may sound silly, but even the way that we position ourselves really does impact um, the way that we have, the way that we connect with Christ. And I don't mean like, oh, if you pray like this, God will really speak to you. You know, it's not like you're getting static and it's like good reception, you know? No, not, that's not what I mean. But what I mean is um, if you go to pray by laying down in your bed, it's probably not going to be very effective. You're probably going to fall asleep. I do, okay? Um, just stuff like that, you know? I mean, consider when we worship, we raise our hands. Why? Because it's, it's an expression of what's in our heart. So it does have an impact. Yeah, hopefully. So instead of praying for 15 minutes, it should be, God, I'll start praying and let me see where it is that you go. Now, that's what we're going to lead into now into meditation. And that's your first point. A foundational area that all Christians need to pioneer is meditation. A foundational area that all Christians need to pioneer, pioneer is meditation. So what is meditation? It's really simple to understand. I wish I could make it more complicated for some of you guys because I know that you like really complex things. But it's really not that complicated. And this is your next point. Christian meditation is simply focusing deeply on Christ. Christian meditation is simply focusing deeply on Christ in its most bare form. Yeah, we can, we can go into it and look at all the different methods and this and that, but Christian meditation is simply focusing deeply on Christ. This is one of the best ways to learn to hear His voice, okay? This is what I'm talking about. I mean this. I mean, when you're pioneering in your relationship with Christ, which, by the way, could be tonight. Should be tonight. Good answer. Could be whenever it is that the Lord's calling you. You understand? The idea is, is, is to sit in his presence, and so often we do this. I, I don't know how many of you guys pray before you go to bed. Um, and pray like this before you go to bed. I'm assuming you all do because um, your parents raised you that way. But the way that I default to and the way that I've had conversations with other people that they default to is we just kind of run through a list. Here's the things that I need that I'm asking you to bless, and here's the things that I'm aware of and I'm thanking you for. That kind of just sums up prayer. You know, bless my wife, help us with the house, bless my son, um, bless our relationship, bless the youth ministry. I pray about some of you guys in specific every time God brings it up on my heart, and I just start thanking them for things, but it becomes really routine. When we pioneer with Christ, meditation isn't me throwing my list before God. It's me sitting in His presence and not praying but just sitting there quietly and going, you know what, Lord, I'm going to meditate either on a scripture, or I'm going to meditate on your promises, or I'm just going to sit here and say, you know what, Lord, I'm listening. And it's not about emptying out your mind. It's about hearing God. And it's not, it's not like rarely have I heard of situations when people have heard God's voice audibly. But get this. I've had God speak to me so many times that if I, the times when he's spoken to me, if I would have heard him audibly, it would have been nowhere near as powerful and prominent as the way that he's spoken to my heart. Anybody else ever experienced when God speaks to you and you know that it's the Lord? Yeah, 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 yeah. And you just know that it's God. And it's not even a, oh man, I really feel like. You're just like, no, I, I know that was God. There's a lot of doubt happening in my head, but I know that was God. And then you end up following through on it and God just kind of shows up in a miraculous way or, or you know, draws near to you as you draw near to him. So really, this is one of the most foundational and fundamental things that we need to do. It's really just kind of sitting there in prayer saying, Lord, you have all of my attention. There's no distractions. And, and I'm just going to meditate on this thing. I'm going to focus deeply on it, whether it's, it's a scripture or whether it's the characteristics of Christ, the attributes of Christ, his love, his sacrifice. And we're going to get a little bit more into that in a minute. Um, in reality, we have a lot of myths, a lot of myths about... Uh, meditation that are incorrect. And I just wanted to take a couple of them and debunk them, all right? There's really three big ones that I really want to look at. Um, and the first one, and I think this is your next point, yeah, 2A, is that all meditation is the same. All meditation is not the same. Yeah, I just saw what I did there. Okay, so 2A, it should say all meditation is the same. And right next to two A, I'm sorry, right next to the A to the left, write myth number one because it looks like it's a truth, but it should say myth. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Sentence two. 
Sentence two is there are some Did I leave out number two? Oh. Yeah, there are some myths to what biblical meditation is. Thanks. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. Yeah, we'll do that. There are some myths to what biblical meditation is. The actual word that I have on my paper is misunderstandings, but let's use myths. That's a lot better. In case you're wondering why that space for myths is like 30 spaces long, it's misunderstandings, but myths is good. Let's keep that. Okay. Sorry, I highlight them on my page, and that one I forgot to highlight. And then 2A is all meditation is the same. All meditation is actually not the same. Um, and the first point under all meditation is the same, the little I, is this. Eastern meditation seeks to empty the mind and to lose your personality. Eastern meditation seeks to empty the mind and lose your personality. Now, in Buddhism, there's a lot of meditation, okay? Uh, I've taken a class where we studied all of the major world religions, um, like everything from Chrislam, which is a combination of Christianity and Islam. True story, it exists. Yeah, it's just chaos. Uh, to, to the Moonies, as a huge cult, to Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, um, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, uh, Satanism. Um, we studied a lot of stuff, Wicca. Um, and here's, here's the thing that Eastern religion, uh, what they teach. And they really, they're, they're teaching it's an emptying of yourself to be able to connect with the cosmic mind and achieve perfect nirvana. And that's just one religion in the specifics. But most of them will always teach you the same thing. It's an emptying of self. Um, let me give you some information on it. Uh, it's a losing of personal self or individuality and merging with the cosmic mind. That's the ultimate goal. Indiv individual personality in Eastern religion is seen as an illusion. So your individual character and your individual character and your individual character, your uniqueness is seen as an illusion. That's just the way that you see it. But really, we're all connected. Um, detachment of that illusion is the final goal. Whereas in Christianity, it's very, very different. This is your next point. Christian meditation seeks to fill you with Christ. It's the emptying of, of your flesh and the infilling of his spirit, if that makes sense. It's the emptying of your flesh and the infilling of his spirit. So the difference between the two, and this is where you could really see it, is in Luke chapter 11, verses 24 through 26. You guys know that verse where it says, when his spirit leaves a man, it goes through many dry places, seeking comfort and finding none, seeking rest and finding none. And when it comes back to the man originally, he sees that all of the rooms are swept and everything's been put back in order. And then he goes and he takes seven more demons with him, more powerful than him, and the status, the latter status of the man is worse than the former. So he actually ends up being off a lot worse. And what Jesus was saying there is he's saying when, when wickedness, when, when either, either a, a, in literal terms like a, a demonic possession or, or your fleshliness, when that leaves, you can't leave house empty. The Holy Spirit's got to come and dwell inside of you. Okay? Very simple teaching. And that's the idea behind Christian meditation. It's not sitting there and going, I'm not going to think about anything and I'm just going to try to achieve the state of not thinking about anything at all. No, it's focusing on Christ. It's not focusing on, on emptying yourself. It's focusing on filling yourself with the Holy Spirit. So there's a very big difference. So when somebody says, oh, yeah, you know, yeah, we practice meditation, it may not be the same thing. Be aware of that. The second myth is that meditation is too difficult or complicated. Meditation is too difficult slash complicated. That's 2B. Meditation is too difficult or complicated. That's the second myth. Okay, a lot of times we think like, man, this is like a big, crazy, you know, probably for like the spiritual elite, youth board should probably be doing this, not me, I'm, you know, I'm not running for Jesus, I just want to be a Christian. Um, and I want to make a suggestion to you. Uh, meditation is supposed to be a part of our lives as much as prayer is. Okay, I would like to say that Really, it's just kind of the part of prayer where you're just listening, but it's a little bit more than that. And I think that that would marginalize what meditation is. It's, it's a deep in focusing on the person of Christ and sitting there and waiting for his presence and listening for his presence. 
Yeah, so it's not difficult. It's not complicated. It's just being able to just come into his presence. It's not only for spiritually elite, and it should be as, as so much a part of your life as fasting, as prayer, as reading the Bible. Those things should also be in there as well, and so should meditation. It's that important to us as, as, as Christians. And then the third myth is that meditation is completely out of touch with the 21st century. So that's meditation is completely out of touch with the 21st century. That's 2C. Meditation is completely out of touch with the 21st century. A lot of times we'll look at things and we'll be like, you know, that's something that they did like way back then, 2,000 years ago. It doesn't really apply to us. Guys, meditating on his word and meditating on who Christ is couldn't be fit for a better century than the 21st century. It fits into our century better than I would say almost any other century. You know why? Because the curse of our age is the superficiality in which we live. Everything is shallow. Even the way that people approach things to sell. You ever hear those advertisements on the radio? It's always like really like doom and gloom kind of music. You know, it's just like our creditors calling. You know, you ever hear those commercials? Is your house underwater? Is da 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 da? You know, it's like he's got this like stern, scary voice. And it's like uh, only like a bass guitar playing in the background. Somebody's playing minors. And then the music changes. And he goes, well, we're here to help. It's so, yeah, you know, it's so shallow. It's so shallow. Or the way that salesmen uh, approach you. I remember I was walking, oh, I'm telling you the story, okay. I remember I was walking down the street in front of Borders when Borders still used to exist, um, like Rocky Ridge and Douglas, right there by that macaroni grill that me and the girl just love to eat at. All right, uh, it's a true story. Um, I was walking through there, and there was this young girl walking towards me, and I was walking this way. I was about 19 at the time. And she's like, hey, what's up? And I thought to myself, oh, I felt like I was at a youth conference. Oh, this person knows who I am and I have no idea who they are. <laughs> you, know? you ever do that at youth conference? Happens all the time. You're like, hey. Oh, the worst is when they're saying hi to somebody behind you at the youth conference. And you're like, hey. And then you just feel dumb. Anyway, so I'm walking and this girl says hi to me. She's like, hey, long time. Don't I know you from blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh, yeah. And she has a satchel on. And then she whips open her satchel. She was a door-to-door -door salesman. She was, like, trying to sell me things in front of borders, like perfumes and stuff. I was like, really? Like, this is the shallowest attempt or approach at selling things. Like, hey, aren't we friends that go way back, buy products from me? You know, like, ugh. Meditation fits so perfectly into our age, and especially as Californians. Because we never have time. We're always occupied. Everything's moving at a million miles a minute. Do you realize that in your car in Sacramento, how many uh, Christian radio stations do we have? Like five or six? Just as Christians, we have like six different radio stations. There's like five or six. You're missing out. Believe you me. 7, 10 a.m., right, Mike? Yeah. <laughs> um, so listen, there is so much fighting for your attention that to be able to sit still, and just think about the things of God and think deeply about them is a, a trait that you're going to have to exercise in your life because it won't come naturally, not in this society. Now, if you had nothing to do after work because they're just, you know, you lived in a one-horse town or something, you know, there's just nothing going on, then it would be a lot easier to meditate on the things of the Lord and draw near to Him. But in this town and in this church and in this community and in this state and in this century, I mean, if you don't have internet, it's like rare. Like everybody has internet and you're all on Facebook or somewhere else, you know, and we're always searching up things, trying to, you know, see funny cat videos or God knows what. Danny, <laughs> all of my examples are real life examples, by the way. So anyway, um, the idea behind it is that, yeah, it fits into the 21st century more than ever. Do we need the ability to just unplug, disconnect and be able to just kind of face ourselves? And focus in on Christ. So that was the third myth. No, I already read off C. 2C, yeah. Meditation is completely out of touch with the 21st century, yeah. I won't go into that, okay. Meditation fits perfectly into the 21st century. It makes us pioneer and we explore the depths of a relationship with Jesus. Christian meditation... 
like all disciplines, has no point unless it is firmly rooted in our day-to-day lives. Real godliness doesn't take us out of the world to some pretend utopia. It helps us live better in the world, and it challenges us to change it. Um, Understand this, that all of these disciplines, prayer, fasting, and so on, they're not for you when you go to church. They're for you in your day-to-day life. They're for you on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, obviously on Fridays because we're here, Saturdays and Sundays obviously as well. But the idea is, is that they're supposed to be in a place in your life where people can, can see the impact of that change. Meditation gives us practical guidance about how to relate better to friends, about how to deal with school issues, about how to get along with your parents, your brothers or sisters. It's a guiding compass, but at the same time, it's so much more. When we meditate, meaning that when we sit there silently in God's presence and we go, you know what, God, I'm just going to sit here and I'm just going to think deeply about the cross, about the price that you paid for me, or I'm going to look at a verse, you know, like at the end of Matthew chapter 28 where Jesus says, go out into the world and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and lo, I am with you always, even in until the end of age just sit there and just and just take that last piece lo i am with you even until the end of age do you realize that because it is the living word because in in john it says in the beginning there was the word and the word was with god and the word was god that there is no limit to the amount of revelation that you can get out of any verse in scripture no limit that means that you could look at a verse and get 10,000 revelations out of it. Like if you had them numbered out. 10,000 giant, oh my God, I just realized something about this verse. And there's a 10,001. It's infinite. So when we sit and we meditate on the things of God, then we don't gain a quantity of information. We gain a quality. And what ends up happening inside of us is that verse that you knew, that you memorized, that you read before, it starts to have an impact in your life. And then the people that are around you, you know, you know what most people want out of Christians? For it to be real. For it to really be real. We were talking about this at discipleship. And most people that I meet in the world don't hate Christians. They usually grew up in a Christian household or they grew up and they went to church somewhere and it was a horrible experience. And they're hoping... That what it is that what was preached was actually true, but what they experienced tells them that it wasn't. Do you realize that when you go out there and you're in the world, when people see the way that your life is different, when people see that in the, in the, in the quality of your character and in the content of your character, that there is value and worth, that's when they'll begin to see that, you know what, what you experience is different than everything that I knew before. A bunch of us guys, we like to hang out at Bloom. At the, it's a coffee shop up in Roseville. And we got to know their staff really well, like really, really well. Like we hang out with them um, over the weekends and stuff sometimes. And, you know, we call them up. When little, my little son was born, I took a photo and I sent it to them. And they all sent it to each other and texted me back. So we know each other. And what's really exciting is that they've gotten to know a group of guys from our church really well. They've gotten to know Ruth really well because she works there. And what one of them was saying to me was this. This is what they said. They grew up in church, some yes, some no. And they said, you know, man, they said, as we get to know your guys, this is one of the guys who doesn't believe in Jesus that's there. He says, you know, man, he goes, as, as, oh, he was there. He goes, as I get to know you and I get to know all of these guys in your group, he goes, man, what you guys have, it's really genuine, and I want that. I was wild. It was like the coolest thing. I was like, yes, people can see Jesus. That's great. That doesn't come from attending services on Sundays. That doesn't come from attending services on Fridays. That comes from daily meeting with the Lord. That comes from, okay, I'm not just going to try to do the bare minimum. Let me, let me ask you a question, and I'm derailing a little bit, but, but this might make a lot more sense, okay? If there's a guy who goes to the hospital because he has a heart condition, and his doctor says, hey, you need to exercise, and that will help you with your heart condition because you're really overweight and out of shape. And that guy starts running down the street, and it's Monday morning, and it's 7 a.m., and, uh, you know, he's running down the street, and you're driving. He's running, and then there's another guy who's also running who's training to run marathons. You're going to look at those two guys, and one of those guys you're going to call an athlete. The other guy you're not. So when me and you do bare Christianity... And we approach it just very reactively. I'm only going to read whenever I feel guilty, and I'm only going to draw near to God. I'm only going to go to church because it's Sunday. Instead of being proactive like the athlete, well, people, what are they going to identify when they look at us? Are they going to see us like the guy who's running just because he's out of shape? Or are they going to see us and say, hey, that guy's clearly an athlete. 
hey, that girl's clearly a Christian. Hey, that guy clearly has an impact made in his life. He's made a decision and he's pursuant after it. I can see an impact in his life. I can see a change. It's not about doing the bare minimum. It's about saying, you know what? I don't just want to have these experiences with you, Lord. I want to experience you in every way. And I want to know you in every way. And anything that has to do with Jesus, I want in. And Lord, if I can, if I can learn to hear you, like it says in John chapter 10, it says that the sheep follow him for they know his voice. If I can learn to hear you better, and this is the mechanism that will help put me in that place for you to grow me, then God, I want in. So yeah, it's super important for us to understand that it's practical and it's not just a compass for guidance a lot of times i'll sit there and i'll just spend time with my eyes closed sometimes i'll just pray in tongues because that's what first corinthians chapter 14 teaches us we went through a whole series on that on the practical and biblical applications of it and sometimes i'll just sit there in silence and i'll go god you lead me and i'll have some thoughts enter my head that have no earthly business being there because i know that they're from heaven i know that they're his i know that it's him speaking to me because I've thought about solving this issue 10,000 times and I haven't been able to figure it out. And then all of a sudden I sit silently in God's presence and this idea enters my head and I go, I can't believe I didn't think of that. I know it's you, Lord. And then you begin to learn his voice and then you begin to know how to follow him. It's not just a guiding compass, but it's also sometimes it becomes this place of supernatural just meeting with God where you can truly sit there and say, man, I get it. Other people read what David said in Psalm 23 when they read and, and David says, my cup runs over. And they're like, oh yeah, you know, that just means he has like an overabundance of a meeting with the Lord. But no, they don't get it, man. I met with the Lord and my cup, it ran over. Sometimes when you're in God's presence, you just have this fantastic experience of a meeting with him because he goes, you know what? I'm going to show you my glory and I'm going to show you that I'm in charge and I'm going to show you that I am the living God and that what I say goes and God just meets with you, and it's just, I mean, it's, it's his holiness just overwhelms you. And some of you guys know exactly what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, it's fantastic. And it isn't required of a youth pastor to be there <clears throat> or a guest speaker to be preaching or an altar call to happen. It's just you in your closet. So I want to look at what the Bible has to say about meditation. The Bible uses two different words, Hebrew words, uh, for the word meditation, which is translated into meditation. And these words are used roughly 58 times in the Bible. I'm just going to throw out a couple of verses just to show you that the Bible definitely talks about meditation. There's more verses. I just chose these ones specifically. Psalm 119, verse 97, it says, Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. In Psalm chapter 1, verse 2, where it talks about the blessed man, it says, But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. In 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 9 through 18, this is when Elijah had killed um, uh, the 600 uh, prophets on Mount Carmel. And then after that, he ran away because Jezebel had threatened him. And then he's really searching out God because he's in fear for his life. Like, he's desperately searching out God. Read that section. You are going to have a blast. It, it really says this. Elijah fell asleep. An angel came and woke him up and brought him a cake. True story. It says cake. I had to read it like six times. I was like, angel's food cake. That's where that came from. <laughs> and Elijah ate a slice and he went back to sleep. And then the angel struck him and woke him up and said, you must eat all the cake for your journey is long. True story. It's in there. It's like the wildest thing. All right. So Elijah is searching out God desperately eats this cake runs nonstop for 40 days must have been a super duper cake okay and he goes to a cave to meet with god and then you guys know the story there was a loud and mighty wind and then there was an earthquake and then you know there was and then there's a still small voice that's i, I couldn't paint a better picture of meditating on god sitting there and focusing deeply. You know, whenever you have a really big problem and you think about it all day and all day long you bring it before God until he answers? Yeah, it's like that. That's what Elijah was doing. All day long he was before the Lord and all night long to the point where he was living on the wilderness just going, God, rescue me. And then an angel showed up and then he went and then he heard that still small voice. Another verse is out of uh, Psalm chapter 63, verse 6. It says, I think upon thee upon my bed. And meditate on thee in the watches of the night. 
This guy's saying that I'm thinking about Jesus when I'm laying down in bed and I'm about to fall asleep. And in the watches of the night, I'm just thinking deeply about you, Lord. I'm meditating on you. I'm, I'm seeking. I'm focusing in. And I'm just, I'm wanting to know you more intimately. Um, let me ask you this. Is, are you guys a bit cold? No? Some of you are a bit cold? Okay. I, I see them shivering. Shimimila de yale. All right? <laughs> this one went to go get her jacket. Is, is that what happened? Did you go get your jacket? Okay. <clears throat> so, continuing on and, ooh, buttoning up. Why meditate? For guidance and a deeper relationship with him? You know, there's a hymn. There's a hymn that says, he walks with me and talks with me. And I just love that phrase. You guys ever experienced that? When you, could, I, when you could genuinely say, you know what, man? The Lord walks with me and talks with me. And he, he just he guides me and he meets me and we just walk together and he talks to me about things and it's the wildest experience. And I just wanted to drop that in there because I loved it. This is why meditation is such a danger to your flesh. Because it places us in his presence where transforming change happens. Meditation is for everyone. Christian meditation. And then life application, and this is the last section. So how do we learn to, uh, to meditate? Number one, and this is actually, oh, hang on, it's not number three. This isn't that. The, the, I'll give you number three in a second. How do we learn to meditate? By meditating. I know, wild. Okay, now I'll give you number three. You don't become a pro overnight. It's uh, who knows that one? It's a, oh, it's good, but I went with the journey. Process was good, but I went with the journey. It's just, it's more adventurous. There's more pioneering in it, all right? Process is like chemistry. You don't become a pro overnight. It's a journey. Your desire to draw closer to God will grow, but as a gift of grace from God, not from your earning. Like John was given the indemnon. It was spot on. I don't have the ability to grow. I can water. I can plant. I can do nutrition, but God gives growth. I don't have the ability to grow in how much I love God. I can put myself in places. I can study his word. I can get to know what it is that he says about me, and then he gives increase. It grows. I can nourish. Sorry. <laughs> That's so distracting. That's the paper dispenser in the guy's bathroom, so you guys are aware. Yeah. <laughs> so distracting. So you don't become a pro overnight. The idea is, is that God gives you that gift. Just pray about it and ask him for it. And then he'll begin to grow a desire for a deeper and more intimate relationship with him. Seeking and receiving that gift of grace is the only thing that will keep us going. Secondly, which is 3A, find a quiet place slash time where you can be alone. Find a quiet place slash time where you can be alone. And I'm just giving you guys some practical applications here. Find a quiet place and time where you guys can be alone. Find a place where you can put your cell phone not on vibrate but off or on do not disturb, and face down. No distractions, quiet, where you can get a little bit loud or louder if you need to in case you might be playing music or you need to pray out loud. Maybe when no one is home, and it's best to have one place so that way you don't end up trying different things and getting discouraged. Just lock in a place, and you know what? It might not even be a place for you. It might be a time. Like, you know, your parents might both be gone to work, and then the house is empty. That's the time, all right? That's like, that's golden right there. Yeah, and play some music. You guys would never guess what number three is because me and God just went back and forth on 3B, just back and forth. And God's like, no, this is what I want. I was like, are you sure? And he's like, no, this is what I want, okay? So just follow me in this. Imagination. Imagination is so important. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't mean like imagination in the silly way, okay? But get this. It'll make a lot of sense, okay? Read a verse. And instead of, oh, okay, you know, this is about God's peace. This is a principle that we need to learn about God's peace. No, put yourself in that verse. Imagine that it's Christ not saying it to the multitudes or to the people. Or just imagine that it's just you and him. And lo, Adi, I will be with you always until the end of age. That's powerful. When you sit there and you go, wait, you were talking to me. And you are talking to me right now. It plays such a big role in that. If I were to tell you to imagine yourself right in his presence, like imagine when you die and you go to heaven and you're face to face with Christ, what are you going to say? 
Now, if I just asked you, what would you say when you're face to face with Christ? That's pretty big. But if I tell you to imagine it, like you're actually there. Imagine yourself at the foot of the cross. And he's there being nailed to the cross for your sins, paying the price to redeem you and redeem me. Imagine yourself right there. It makes a huge impact. If I told you to imagine yourself in your throne room, in his throne room, what would you say? See, putting yourself in those situations really has an impact because they're real and it becomes a bridge to reality. Imagine yourself in his promise, in his presence, and him making a promise, not to all humanity, but specifically to you. And then start thinking deeply and to see where the Holy Spirit leads you. And then lastly, hang on, I'll give you lastly in a second. Yeah, don't be discouraged if it's hard at first, guys. It's always hard when you start. It's always difficult at the beginning. But you know what? I, I keep on thinking about this because God's truth, they just kind of have a way of coming back up. Andrew taught on this several weeks back, and I just keep on thinking about it. God just kind of put that in my heart about how, you know, everything that's right, that's righteous, that's godly, that's correct is really hard to do right now, but it gets much easier and better as time progresses. And everything that's really easy and sinful, it's so easy to do it now, and then it just gets worse and worse later. So even with this, even with prayer, even with meditation, even with study, it's going to be hard right in the beginning. It's going to be a bit difficult. You're not really going to know. You're like, oh, this is kind of weird, you know? But the idea is, is to keep on drawing near. And then God is faithful. And then lastly, is set a time this week to pioneer in meditation. Set a time this week to pioneer in meditation. So this week, make it real. It's not just Fridays and Sundays. It's all throughout the week. And this week, make it real. Set a time for yourself to pioneer in meditation. And actually, that's what the back's for. In the back right now, there's a weekly challenge. Okay. On the bottom, there's seven pitfalls to avoid. Last week, we also had seven uh, days of devotions, just little devotions for you guys. This week, we have a weekly challenge. Spend some time meditating. Set a time. At the very top line, I was supposed to write it, but I forgot. Um, at the very top line, write it down. You can even do it now. Just write it down and be like, you know what? Tuesday at 7 o'clock, it's me and Jesus. Except if you're in discipleship. You better be there, right? <laughs> 7 a.m., all right? <laughs> That's the idea. Hang on. Um, and then the rest of the lines are after you spend that time with Christ, just write a reflection of what you experienced. And you know what that's for? The reflection? Not for today. It's for months from now. When you look back and you go, man, I remember that day. And I remember that great thing or that difficult thing or that, you know, way that God met with me and that real thing. I don't know. Whatever it is that you write. And it's a really great way of reflecting and kind of measuring the journey. It's really exciting. Um... I want to invite you guys to stand. Yeah, which one did you guys need? Number four? Oh, I'm sorry. I missed this one. Time with God is on his schedule, not always yours. Sorry about that, guys. I actually missed that entire thing. It was out of 1 Thessalonians 5.17, which says pray without ceasing, meaning that ceasing, meaning that there are times... Let me, let me put it this way, that last section. Okay, the last part. Let me just put it this way. Sometimes God will nudge your heart to spend time with him, not at 7 a.m. for 15 minutes. Sometimes it will be the middle of you hanging out with your friends, and God's like, okay, right now I want to talk to you. You just feel a conviction to talk to him. Listen, listen. Five minutes in his timing will far outweigh 10 hours in yours. When he says, hey, hey, I want us to talk right then. Drop what you're doing and be like, be like, like it says in scriptures, here I am, Lord. Boom, you got me. You have my attention. I'm right here. And that's what grows your relationship. I invite you guys to bow your heads. Father God, we come before you, O Lord. And God, I just, I pray, O God, that Lord, 